All right. Well, hello. I'm Tiffany Fennell, Chair of the VA Section of Division 18, and I'd like to welcome everyone to today's webinar titled First Episode Psychosis Interventions in VA, presented by Drs. Amy Wilson, Shirley Glenn, Rachel Calixt, and Emily Gagan. This webinar is sponsored by the VA Section of APA Division 18, Psychologists and Public Service. Division 18 is considered the home division for VA psychologists in APA, as well as for other public service psychologists like those in community and state hospitals, Indian Country, criminal justice, and police and public safety. For more information about Division 18 and the VA section, please check out the files and web links pods for a brochure and links to our website, Twitter, and Facebook page. And you'll also find a copy of today's slides in the files pod that you can download for reference. All questions can be entered into the chat box and we'll leave time towards the end to answer questions. And if you experience any technical hiccups, please let me know in the chat box and I'll attend to you as quickly as possible. So I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. First, there's Dr. Amy Wilson. She's Bedford VA Medical Center's Local Recovery Coordinator. And in that capacity, she is a champion for the recovery model and evidence-based practices for individuals with psychosis. Dr. Wilson is the program manager for the STEER program, which is one of the first coordinated specialty care programs in VA. And she's also the co-chair of Bedford's Psychosocial Rehabilitation and Recovery Postgraduate Fellowship. Dr. Shirley Glenn is a licensed clinical psychologist in the UCLA Department of Psychiatry in biobehavioral sciences and at the VA Greater Los Angeles Healthcare System at West Los Angeles. Her research highlights the critical importance of the environment in recovery from a serious psychiatric illness such as schizophrenia, bipolar illness, and PTSD. We also have Dr. Rachel Calixt. She's a psychologist at the Bedford VA. She values providing recovery-oriented, resiliency-focused services to veterans through a coordinated specialty care model which is reflected in her work in the STEER First Episode Psychosis Program, Supported Employment and Education, Peer Services, and Suicide Prevention. And finally, Dr. Emily Gagan is currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Alpert Medical School of Brown University. Her clinical and research interests include psychosocial treatment for first episode psychosis, with a particular emphasis on the relevance of adolescent development and social functioning on outcomes in this population. Without further delay, I'll turn the mic over to Dr. Glenn. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting some of you, and for those of you whom I haven't, um, it's really wonderful to find uh, people who are interested in helping people with serious mental illness in the VA. Um, we are a team of folks from different VAs who have are working together in a learning collaborative to improve outcomes in veterans who are having a recent onset of psychosis. And I just want to set the stage for the work you're going to hear about today and offer a little context. Um, coming out of the recovery movement, which is now, you know, say around 25, 30 years old, was a growing appreciation that perhaps if we gave people a bolus, a really good treatment, when they first develop psychotic symptoms, that they really might be able to recover their functioning and we could change the trajectory of their illness. Now, the, the genesis of this idea came primarily in countries where there were single payer systems. Um, in uh, several countries in Europe and Canada and Australia. And, and they actually, about 20 years ago in Italy, started some of the first studies and, and in Australia to really identify people with the first episode of psychosis, to provide them a lot of psychosocial and tailored pharmacological treatment, and then to see what happened. And as you'll hear from the work presented here, there's good data to suggest this is a good way to help people. Now, the, these kinds of interventions are easier to do where you have a single payer system because you can, off, you can essentially require professionals, the health professionals, to develop surveillance programs to find folks having a recent onset of psychosis, which is not always easy, and then to provide standardized state-of-the-art treatment. 
It's harder to do this in the U.S., of course, because we have a multi-payer system where nobody can require a psychiatrist or a GP or a hospital to do anything. Um, so although there's been interest in this in the U.S., we have lagged. Um, but as you'll hear, um, over the past 10 years, there's been quite a bit of growth in this area. And now every state in the, in the U.S. has dedicated funding to improve outcomes in people with a first episode of psychosis. And I should say here, we're primarily talking about non-affective psychosis. Um, it's been harder to bring this issue into the VA. In a way, you would think it's easier because we are, in essence, a single-payer system. But we have the challenges of, I think many of us are used to dealing with more long-term clients who, uh, and, and, and um, so we don't, you know, the, the average person, if you look at who's getting services in the psychosis registry in the VA, is typically a male who's in his 50s. So you don't necessarily think of recent onset folks. And in addition, um, people, we, we know that many, many people with whom we work, they have their first episode of psychosis in the DOD. And just moving people into the VA can be challenging and require some um, careful attention um, and some warm handoffs, which we're just in the process of developing. Um, so this has all been percolating out in the community over the past 10 years now. And it's wonderful that many of the people on the call today have been working to bring this work into the VA. And as I say, we now have a quite thriving learning collaborative um, to do this kind of work. And if anybody on the call is interested in joining our learning collaborative and really has a commitment to trying to help in this arena, um, feel free to reach out to me, and uh, I'll give you more details on what we're doing. Um, but two of the people who have really um, done some of the outstanding work in the VA uh, in this area are Amy Wilson and Emily Gagan. And um, we have all been working together for about the past six months, trying to share ideas and, uh, you know, really make this kind of a groundswell of effort in the VA. You should know there is now actually national guidance that's going to come out that Dan Bradford is organizing. So there's some recognition in headquarters that um, this is an area of interest. But mostly it's a groundswell area from interested people saying we're just going to try to improve care and bring evidence-based care into recent onset treatment of veterans. Um, so with that context, I'll turn it over to you, Amy, and you can start the talk. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. Um, so I'm just going to give a, a real quick overview of what we're going to be talking about today. Shirley gave a, a lovely introduction. Uh, and uh, if people have questions, feel free to, to jump in. We'd be happy to, to take them as we talk. So uh, just to orient you, we're going we're gonna to go into a little bit more detail about uh, an overview of first episode psychosis programs at the VA. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of the unique factors uh, that are, we're seeing with our veterans that make this work uh, slightly different in the veteran population than the non-veteran population. Uh, we're going to go into a little bit of the both promises and challenges uh, structurally within the VA system and the military, and uh, look at how these structures uh, both can support and cause a, a couple challenges uh, in the work. A brief case presentation, and then we're going to talk a little bit about where uh, these programs stand uh, in the country in VA. So I'm going to hand this over now to Emily. Um, and Emily, I'm not sure if you're controlling the slides on your end or if you want me to advance them for you. I think I can as well. Is that right, go ahead. If you need help, I am here. Okay. Uh, yeah, great. So um, as Shirley kind of gave a brief overview of, we're going to talk a little bit first of kind of the history of first episode treatment. Some of you all may be familiar with this, um, but just to kind of set the stage for how we got to where we are now. Um, so to kind of clarify or maybe, you know, point out the lack of clarification, um, what 
how do we define a first episode of psychosis? So this has been defined in a number of different ways. I don't you know, know that there's any very clear guidelines, but um, of course it is the first time that someone experiences any sort of uh, severe psychotic symptoms that you know, result in some sort of diagnosis, although what that diagnosis is can be quite varied and can change over time. Um, the age of onset is generally between 18 to 35. Uh, can be a little earlier for men, a little later for women. Um, and generally there has been some decline in some sort of functioning, one or more areas of functioning prior to the onset of these psychotic symptoms. That's not always the case, um, but it is very uh, um, common that, that that is the case. Um, as we define first episode psychosis, that usually excludes mood disorders with psychotic features. Um, but it does include the schizophrenia spectrum disorder, so schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, et cetera. Um, and first episode psychosis does often evolve into schizophrenia, um, and people make meet criteria for that diagnosis already. Um, but uh, I guess we're not seeing the slides moving. Uh, I did advance them to the the first episode of psychosis slides. Are we able to see those? Yeah, I think I may just re-upload the slides so that that way they'll move with you. I don't, I don't know where the hiccup went, but I'll get it fixed right away. But go ahead and continue on with your present. Oh, now it's working. Oh, that's weird. I, I didn't think that. differently. Is it on the first episode of psychosis slide? That's what I'm seeing. Okay. Um, and if I switch it now, ask, it, did it move? Yes, and I'll ask participants um, if they are able to see that the slides have advanced. Okay. So surely I can tell it moved. You're on history of FTP okay. treatment. Okay, great. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, so speaking about the, the history of, of treatment, um, you know, and as Shirley mentioned and as we'll talk quite a bit more about, um, single-payer systems, particularly in the U.S., that means the VA can be uniquely uh, appropriate and situated to do this kind of work. Um, the treatment model really began in Australia um, in the 90s, and then, as Shirley pointed out, in Italy as well. And they really identified three key elements that uh, contribute to this work, um, both or including early recognition of individuals that um, are experiencing symptoms and have since then actually moved towards early recognition of folks that may be at risk of developing symptoms and providing assistance. And then uh, really thorough and clear initial assessment and treatment and then the promotion of recovery. And that in particular I think was a key factor in developing this coordinated treatment as you know folks early on in this uh, process do have a great deal of opportunity for recovery, and as we'll see, you know, the data has kind of borne that out, um, but making sure to instill that into the treatment provided was kind of a key uh, factor. Um, so from Australia, it expanded to other uh, countries, England, Denmark, Norway, Canada were kind of one, uh, several of the big contributors early on. Um, and if you'll notice, all those countries do have national health care systems, and so as you might imagine, it, these kinds of programs were much more easily implemented and disseminated because of that. Um, they all showed very significant effectiveness in reducing uh, any sort of decline in functioning or uh, future impairment associated with these symptoms. It was shown to be more effective than treatment as usual, and that included uh, improvements across the board, really, um, both in symptoms of psychosis, positive and negative, um, quality of life, and importantly, uh, at this stage of life, you know, when folks are, are still in their late teens, early 20s, into their 20s, social and vocational recovery, that people were doing a lot better in all of those areas when they were uh, a part of these programs. Um, and another key factor that, you know, was uh, a part of, of this treatment is that team, the team approach is really the critical piece. Um, it includes both a, a manager that's kind of uh, providing supervision and kind of directing the services, uh, as well as the interventionists that are providing individual therapy, the family interventions, 
then management, and then that vocational or educational support. Um, more recently, uh, we've also come to, to understand that case management and peer support are both uh, also quite uh, useful uh, elements of this work. Another big piece that came out of all of this research was that the duration of untreated psychosis is a very important uh, predictor of outcomes. So when we say duration of untreated psychosis, we mean the time between the onset of symptoms and the first uh, treatment that a person receives. And a lot of research has indicated that longer DUP is associated with much worse outcomes and functioning primarily in functioning, but also in symptoms um, as well. And so the, the goal then of these programs is to shorten that uh, interval. So moving along, hopefully we can still see the slides moving. Um, so in the United States, uh, as then you might imagine by now, a large scale implement implementation of any of these programs has been quite difficult. Uh, relatively to the other countries due to uh, our healthcare system. And this kind of problem has been observed more broadly in disseminating evidence-based mental health care to any clinical practice settings. Um, because as Shirley pointed out, we can't really prescribe what you know certain providers do or, or how they uh, deliver care. It's harder to then disseminate um, this sort of thing. So as a result, many of the programs, most of the programs in the U.S. were developed as specialty clinics but that were associated with academic research programs. And it actually wasn't until 2012, at least to my knowledge, that any study was published on any effectiveness of any of these programs. Um, and then the study in 2015 by uh, Dr. Srihari at Yale was kind of the, the next major uh, study looking at their program, which is the STEP program. Um, there was also a white paper published in 2014 by Bob Heinsohn. Um, that was following, which was a quite a big deal, the 5% set aside um, from SAMHSA's mental health block grant. And as Shirley mentioned now, every state has some funds set aside for early intervention. But as you'll notice, this is all within the past, you know, less than 10 years, and other countries have been at this for quite some time. So the U.S. has, has definitely lagged behind in this area. Um, so the biggest piece of uh, or the United States' contribution, so to speak, to uh, this body of research is the RAISE study, or the Recovery After an Initial Schizophrenia Episode. And it was an NIMH-funded uh, RCT that was looking at the feasibility of implementing first episode interventions in spe specifically in non-specialty settings. So uh, there were 34 community mental health settings um, across 21 different states over two years, and they were randomized by site to either receive, uh, or I'm sorry, provide treatment as usual uh, or coordinated specialty care. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that term means, um, but that was the specialty first episode intervention. And the results from that study uh, were pretty resounding. Um, the, those that received the coordinated specialty care intervention remained in treatment longer, reported uh, significantly improved quality of life, which was kind of the major outcome that we were looking at in that study. And then they were more likely to be in school or working, again, a really key outcome for people in this demographic. And then uh, they were taking lower doses of antipsychotic meds. And again, uh, it was reinforced that folks with shorter DUPs or duration of untreated psychosis had the best gains. Um, so that uh, this is the graphic that illustrates that coordinated specialty care. So we imagine it, as I said, as a team approach. Um, surrounding the client, there are all these interventions kind of delivered at once and in coordination with one another. So the communication among the team and between the team members is critical. Um, you know, the medication med management is, is communicating with the psychotherapy provider who's also uh, communicating with the person providing family support and then supported education and employment as well as case management. Uh, so then um, the, from this uh, came the Navigate model, um, which is how we are now uh, hoping to disseminate this intervention to uh, um, various programs. So it's designed, like I said, to be implemented in a coordinated manner. The individual therapy consists of individual resiliency training, or IRT. Um, it has its basis in uh, CBT for psychosis. It has elements of psychoeducation 
illness and management recovery, um, et cetera, but it has a quite a significant focus on recovery and resiliency. And then uh, the med management piece is uh, a combination of both shared decision making and algorithms to assist the providers in determining um, best prescribing practices. Family psychoeducation, which is a, a big piece and uh, one that's a consideration for the limitations we have within the VA that um, are my other uh, colleagues will talk more about. And then also supported employment, employment and education. Um, the manuals for this are free and they can be downloaded at that website, um, navigateconsultants.org. Um, and as a, you know, the rest of this presentation will cover, there are significant opportunities within VA uh, with existing services to approximate this model um, that already are available to veterans, but there are, of course, limitations and considerations on why it's not as easy as we might hope it would be. Um, and I think that is all. Yeah, so I'll turn that over to Rachel and she can uh, talk with us more about um, some of the specific considerations when working with veterans. Great. Thank you, Emily. Um, so today we'll be focusing on some of the clinical considerations that come up um, with the first episode psychosis population. Uh, some of this will review some of the anecdotes from our clinical practice as well as research. Um, many of the considerations that we'll talk about today do pertain to veterans, um, but uh, we also want you to keep in mind that many of this stuff will apply to um, the general early episode psychosis population. Can people see the, did the slide advance for other people? No. No. Okay. What about now? Great. Great. <laughs> okay. So one of the major challenges that we've found um, with getting folks in early episode psychosis um, is getting them into care as well as keeping them engaged so that they're staying in care. Um, this is an area of focus that we think is important to highlight because it can certainly have implications for duration of untreated psychosis. Um, so DUP is an important metric that we use to um, assess and collect data on first episode psychosis. Um, early intervention efforts should be targeting this metric of DUP, um, as research has found that shorter duration of untreated psychosis can just certainly have better outcomes um, for individuals as far as their psychosocial functioning and their quality of life. Um, so early intervention and engagement is certainly a piece that we, we want to focus on. Um, and when we talk about early intervention and engagement, we're talking about proactive and assertive outreach. So studies have shown that we, we can't necessarily expect that individuals are just going to show up in our, at our doors and looking for, for treatment. Um, so I think it's our role to make sure that we're doing that proactive and assertive outreach to engage folks. You know, other things that we want to consider include um, what are the pathways to care as far as engaging veterans in early episodes. And there hasn't been too much research on this, but a few studies have shown that typically that first contact is made with emergency services. So that's certainly an area that we can target as far as community partnerships um, to make sure that we are able to catch folks who are in early episode and coming into care. And Dr. Wilson will talk a little bit more about our efforts here at the Bedford VA. That is certainly an area that we are targeting here um, in our program. So when we talk about engagement with, with folks, two of the things we want to think about are when are we doing this engagement and how. So when we're engaging folks with early episode psychosis, one of the things that we really want to emphasize is um, focusing on their felt needs, whatever they perceive as their goals uh, for the work that you're doing. And that can be an opportunity to not only build rapport with the veterans, but can certainly serve as buy-in for engaging them in the work that we want to do. 
So all of the work that we do should be centered around their felt needs and their, their goals. Oftentimes, these goals are developmentally appropriate. Um, and so these things can include employment, education, romantic relationships, as well as independent living. So a lot of the vets that we work with want to acquire their own uh, independent housing out in the community. And that's certainly something that we want to make sure that we're centering our work with them around. Again, as I had mentioned, oftentimes first contact is in an acute episode, um, so either through emergency services or our inpatient units. Um, so again, those are opportunities to do in some assertive outreach and engagement. Um, and again, that outreach and engagement should be focused on whatever they see as essential for improving their community functioning and reducing the frequency of these inpatient hospitalizations. So part of that discussion can involve what is this current hospitalization keeping them from? That might be important roles and responsibilities that they have out in the community, such as uh, employment, uh, family responsibilities, uh, whatever it is that they're not able to do because of their, their current circumstances. Uh, what we also find is that veterans may or may not be engaged with their families, but that certainly could present an opportunity for getting veterans and individuals in early episode psychosis connected to care. Um, so engaging members of their support network can be very useful. Um, we've highlighted family, but this can also include spiritual leaders, uh, employers, faculty at schools, um, Whoever is in their important community network, we want to make sure that we're also engaging them um, and doing assertive outreach with those community members as well. Um, I'll say a little bit more on family engagement in a little bit. So another consideration for when this engagement takes place is the age of onset for psychosis. So there have been a few studies that have shown that the age of onset is a little bit later for veterans. On average, vets' age of onset is approximately 27, and for non-vets, it's approximately 24. Um, so generally, it appears that for veterans, there is that later age of onset. Um, we're generally not seeing many veterans in the 18 to 24 range who have a diagnosis of um, psychosis. Uh, engaging in our VA services. Uh, we have a couple of theories about that. Um, so for one, there is a, a minimum level of functioning that individuals do need to demonstrate in order to enlist in the military. Um, so it's possible that the veteran age of onset is a little bit later because um, they're not presenting until much later. Even after enlisting in the military, we know that uh, age of onset and diagnosis can be later because individuals aren't necessarily presenting, um, presenting or reporting these difficulties associated with onset of psychosis. Uh, oftentimes, there's a desire to hide these symptoms and not disclose because of a fear of being taken away from their duties. Um, and in fact, many individuals actually do end up being medically discharged because of onset of psychosis. Um, so. That's another barrier to individuals reporting, and again, that diagnosis ends up happening much later for veterans. All right, another important clin clinical consideration for this population is PTSD. Um, generally, the rates of PTSD, according to the National Center for PTSD, for our returning veterans, so OEF, OIF, and OND vets, is about 11 to 20 percent meet criteria within a given year. Um, female veterans tend to have the uh, highest rates of PTSD compared to female and male uh, civilians and uh, veterans as well. Um, the research has shown that male veterans do tend to have a longer delay in seeking treatment. And we could do an entire presentation on gender and socialization around health seeking, um, as well as the impact of military culture around toughness. 
Um, so there are certainly those barriers as well that um, contribute to delays in seeking treatment. Um, the other consideration is for uh, veterans with SMI who are also um, experiencing symptoms of PTSD. So a research study by Calhoun and colleagues actually found that um, while about 47% of individuals in the study met criteria for PTSD, only about 14% were actually screened positive and had that diagnosis in their chart. Um, and that can certainly have implications for the services that are being delivered to veterans, um, as well as the way that we're, we're assessing PTSD. So this, this begs the question, is this being assessed? How is it being assessed? And how can we improve that assessment? It's quite possible that there are some overlapping symptoms that can certainly complicate diagnosis. And so I think uh, making sure that we're doing more to improve our assessment and screening tools can certainly help with that. Um, it's also quite common for PTSD to coincide and even precipitate onset of um, diagnosis of, P uh, of psychosis. So um, that certainly also complicates uh, that diagnosis as well. Two aspects of trauma that uh, we wanted to highlight um, in the next couple of slides, slides. The first being trauma associated with that first episode um, experience. So, you know, this is an area that maybe not is not given enough attention. You know, Kim Muser and colleagues have talked about some of the, the traumatizing experiences that come along with that onset of um, onset of symptoms and that first diagnosis. Oftentimes individuals are thinking about the implications for their lives and a certain certainly an impact that uh, stigma and internalized stigma, I should specify, has on um, these concerns that they have. There might also be uh, confusion and questions about identity. Um, and furthermore, that first contact, as we said, often occurs through a, a hospitalization or an acute episode. Um, and that can certainly be traumatizing in itself. You know, first contact on an inpatient unit can certainly be intimidating. Um, so this is certainly an area of focus that we want to emphasize is being able to process that experience of the early onset and that first diagnosis. There are interventions aimed at that specifically. So as Emily highlighted earlier, the Navigate model and the Navigate manual have um, interventions in place to actually specifically process that early episode experience. Um, this also includes relapse prevention and uh, proactive planning, shared decision making, and um, tools for engagement. It's quite common that oftentimes veterans have a hard time discussing these experiences, especially if it's very early um, in the, that onset. So the manuals do offer guidance for how to have that conversation, as well as stories that are shared by others about their experiences that the veterans might be able to relate to. I think an important note here is that these conversations should absolutely tie back into the veterans' goals. So we want all of the, the conversations to be centered around implications for the, the goals that they have um, and the work that you want to do moving forward. Another aspect of trauma that we wanted to highlight is military sexual trauma. And when we talk about MST, we're talking about assault or battery of a sexual nature or sexual harassment that's occurred while the veteran was on active duty, active duty for training, or inactive duty. An important note about these figures here, um, overall, the incidence rate is higher for men, um, again, because the number of men outweighs the number of women who are enrolled in the military, but the relative rate of MST are higher for women than men. Um, we don't really have much research on MST and SMI and um, prevalence across these populations, um, but that is certainly an area that might be worth focusing um, to what extent individuals who 
have a, a diagnosis of FMI, have experienced military sexual trauma. Another important consideration, especially uh, one of the missions of the VA is suicide prevention. Um, so there are some figures here that, uh, uh, some figures that uh, demonstrate the, the difficulties that we have engaging folks um, who are having thoughts about suicide. One figure that we often cite is that 20 veterans a day die by suicide. Of those 20 veterans, approximately six are engaged in VA care. Um, which begs the question again of what can we do to engage folks who are not in care? Um, so again, this brings back the discussions about engagement and assertive outreach. Um, more specifically, uh, among veterans with SMI, um, compared to non-veterans, these veterans tend to have higher rates of suicidal ideation and death ideation. Um, so while suicide prevention is a key mission in the VA, this suggests the importance of suicide prevention uh, targeting veterans with SMI. Um, so just as with the other uh, considerations that we've had uh, for PTSD and SMI, suicide prevention is certainly an area where we do see barriers to help seeking. And again, these are opportunities for community outreach and family engagement. Uh, so presently, we don't have any of the veterans in our STEER program who have been willing to engage family in that uh, arm of the Navigate manual. Um, that's something more that Dr. Wilson will, will discuss. Um, but we do think that there are some aspects of veteran, um, the veteran population that do make that family engagement difficult. So for example, many veterans enlist in the military because of uh, poor family environments and desires to escape. Um, so it's quite possible that when they are separating that there is still that strained relationship with their family. Um, in addition, it might not feel normative for veterans to engage their family in the work that we do. Um, they either don't want to burden them or they're just used to the culture of not speaking about the work that they have done in the military um, and not wanting to, to burden their family members with that information. Um, but how, however, research has shown that veterans with SMI generally do want their families involved in care. And so more efforts on shared decision making and family engagement can certainly help with that. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Wilson. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the systemic uh, factors associated both with the VA and the military that I think make this work uh, particularly promising, but also particularly challenging for implementation. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Glenn really kind of foreshadowed very nicely in pointing out that uh, single-payer healthcare systems uh, are really kind of ideally suited. And uh, obviously, VA is a single-payer healthcare system. So I think there's... Uh, a lot of advantage to trying to implement these programs in VA, um, but as noted, there are challenges as well. So just talking a little bit about the military and uh, the transition between um, military service and uh, veteran status, uh, one major advantage that we have with this population is that there is an incredibly short duration of untreated psychosis uh, that's been reported uh, in military samples. Now, this is a single sample uh, and comes out of our colleagues from the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, uh, their psychiatric transition program. We're really happy that one of the authors on this paper, Dr. Kuhler, uh, is involved with our learning collaborative. So we do have a little bit of access to uh, active duty military members in our collaborative. What they found in this uh, study was that given the structure in the military, uh, the high visibility of uh, military members and uh, the intensive demands, functional demands that are placed on uh, active duty military members, they able to identify and begin essentially mandating treatment very quickly. And in this study, they found uh, a modal duration of untreated psychosis of zero to two days, which 
is completely flabbergasting. Uh, you can see with the mean is a, a bit skewed, so there's obviously a handful of people in that sample who uh, managed to escape treatment for a bit longer, uh, but generally speaking, they're able to implement treatment very quickly. There are certainly pros and cons to this. Anecdotally, we work with some veterans who, uh, going back to that point about the trauma of the first episode, uh, have reported their military treatment being very um, uh, coercive and uh, not consistent with what they wanted at the time. But at least just sort of on that one metric alone, we do have a lot of opportunity to be able to provide consistent uh, evidence-based interventions across the board. Uh, just very, very quickly, uh, if you're not familiar with the way that the military manages people who have uh, psychotic spectrum illnesses, they're very quickly, they tend to be very quickly um, discharged from the military through a process called a, a med board. Uh, I'm not going to, for the interest of time, I want to kind of skip past this, but uh, you should just know that uh, an additional factor that a lot of our veterans are really struggling with is not only the identity changes in terms of like being diagnosed with a serious mental illness, but also losing their identity as a military service member, which is virtually guaranteed to happen. So uh, oftentimes, if you know VA, you know there is quite a gap between uh, the military and VA, and a lot of veterans find themselves uh, a bit lost along the ways. Uh, there are a lot of benefits to treatment in the VA system. Uh, as we noted, single-payer healthcare system. It is a large, centralized system. Uh, we can have a lot of control over how uh, interventions are implemented. Uh, we also have a lot of resources. Uh, one area that we've been looking at a lot in Vision 1 is the utilization of uh, telehealth resources, uh, being a federal federal government institution, we're able to provide interventions across state lines, which is a major advantage that the VA has that our um, non-VA colleagues cannot uh, utilize. Uh, we also, we know that the, and we know that the OAF, OIF, OND vets find this to be an acceptable uh, way of receiving treatment. Uh, we also, in VA, get reimbursement to cover vocational services, which, as I found out, is not guaranteed outside of VA. So a very important arm in this intervention certainly is vocational services. And uh, I've spoken to many non-VA providers who are, are quite jealous of that. Uh, we also have a lot of access for EDPs within the VA system. Uh, this can really help with some of the comorbid uh, challenges that our veterans are facing. Uh, but I should note that a lot of SMI-specific interventions are lacking specifically CBT for psychosis. Um, I'm going to skip through this pretty quickly, again, in interest of time. Uh, but just to note that uh, roughly 62% of uh, the OEF, OIF, OND returning veterans have accessed VA health care since 2012. The, that was as of 2015. Uh, there are some that are showing up with diagnoses of affective psychosis. Uh, those are the top four diagnoses, at least uh, uh, according to the Department of Veteran Affairs. So we're not necessarily seeing huge numbers of people with psychotic spectrum illnesses, uh, but certainly they are, are here. Um, there are a number of barriers for our returning vets uh, to engaging in VA services. Uh, one study found that approximately 30 to 40 percent either didn't know how to enroll in care, don't think they're eligible for services, or just generally not aware that they have mental health care benefits. Obviously, this is a, a major challenge for us if uh, a sizable portion of our vets don't even know that they're eligible for care. Um, and approximately half in one another study of uh, returning vets found that vets who might need mental health treatment are not currently receiving it. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a, a holdover from an earlier uh, slide that or presentation that we did. But um, veterans, OEF, OIF, OND vets uh, may be particularly susceptible to internalized stigma, which makes it even obviously more challenging for them to engage in our care. 
So I'm going to shift modes a little bit now and talk just very quickly about two veterans that we've seen at Bedford. And I, I chose these two vets because I think they illustrate nicely two, um, two pathways to care that we've seen. Uh, the first is for a vet that, uh, and I apologize, this is a little bit smaller than I thought it would be. Uh, the first is a vet that uh, actually had symptom onset in active duty military. And the second is a vet that's uh, had onset since um, discharging from the military. So uh, we do see predominantly male veterans. I believe we have one female vet that we're currently seeing. Um, uh, the first vet is a 24-year-old single Caucasian male. As I said, he began having symptoms when he was in the military. Um, he's a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder. and uh, he, he started having a lot of paranoia, a lot of obviously mood uh, challenges, became very manic, uh, believed that people were out to get him, and ended up getting hospitalized there. Uh, was discharged shortly thereafter. He's currently living with his parents, who are, are very, very supportive, although he's been really reluctant to engage them in care, uh, in his care. She, currently, his symptoms are generally well controlled. Uh, Really, his biggest challenge at this point is that he's experiencing a lot of depression uh, and feeling like he lacks purpose. Uh, he is working, but he kind of hates his job, and uh, it's taken a lot of prodding, but he's recently started meeting with people from our Vogue Rehab Department and is really, really enjoying that, um, so I'm, I'm hopeful that'll help him out. Currently, uh, he's engaged in the individual therapy arm, medication management, and voc uh, rehabilitation. Our second vet um, has been out of the military for a little over five years. He's a 27-year-old male vet, uh, Navy veteran. Uh, his symptoms started really, really, really recently uh, in the fall of 2018. He's got a lot of ideas of reference, uh, quite paranoid, and some kind of sub threshold delusions, which occasionally, you know, cross the threshold, but, you know, at current, he's, he's really questioning them. The symptoms are in partial remission. I don't think he really ever fully had what I would call a psychotic break, although he got very close to it. He's currently unemployed. He lost his job, likely due to some consequences of what was happening uh, when his symptoms were flaring up in the fall. He became very paranoid uh, about his employers and thought that something was happening, although he can't quite articulate what it was. Uh, his wife and her family really encouraged them to engage in treatment. She's actually from Ireland, and they were over in Ireland when his symptoms were uh, really uh, pronounced for him, and they brought him to an uncle who was a psychiatrist there and insisted he get care. Uh, He's been meeting with me. Uh, we had, he's really refusing medication and really thinks that he's going to be able to get a job and doesn't want vogue rehab at this point. He's been open to having his wife uh, come to sessions. We had one joint meeting, although she's now back in Ireland and he's going to be moving hypothetically next week. So um, we're doing a lot of work on trying to talk about relapse prevention and identifying appropriate resources for him in Ireland, which I can say is a little bit of a challenge. So let's just kind of have a quick snapshot of two of the vets that uh, we've been seeing at Bedford. I want to talk a little bit about where we stand with these efforts at VA right now. So as uh, Shelley was talking about earlier, there's a lot of interest in implementing first episode psychosis interventions in VA. Uh, but we don't really, we have no guidance right now from VACO uh, or VA Central Office for non-VA folks. Uh, but one of our colleagues, Dr. Dan Bradford, is working on developing national guidelines, uh, particularly related to engagement of veterans and uh, suggesting some interventions that we should be utilizing. Uh, Shirley also mentioned our learning collaborative. We have representatives from uh, VISN 1, 6, 21, and 22. Uh, for those not from the VA, that's basically East Coast, West Coast, and uh, uh, one little group out in St. Louis, I believe. 
Uh, we're looking at hub and spoke models where, we, like we mentioned, uh, telehealth resources earlier. We're trying to figure out how we can utilize some of the resources across different hospitals to be able to really provide all the arms of the intervention. Uh, that's been a, a more recent development. Uh, and there's a, a number of barriers uh, within VA that are really making this a bit challenging, uh, in addition to the ones that I mentioned before. We have a, a culture of treating long-term patients. Uh, sometimes the expectations for recovery are very low. Uh, obviously, that's essentially the antithesis of this first episode psychosis uh, intervention. We're expecting recovery from people. As noted earlier, there's a lot of lack in training and intervention specific to psychosis. We certainly have uh, a handful that are, are very much in the wheelhouse. Uh, particularly around family uh, interventions and uh, social skills training. Uh, but CBT for psychosis is a challenge, and, and some of our medication providers are really not used to uh, how to work with young veterans that are uh, having their first episode. Uh, also questions about what is recent onset. Uh, we're finding that there are often people are misdiagnosed early. Uh, providers, again, related to that lack of treatment, often don't know what these veterans look like or what some of the symptoms and signs might present as. Uh, oftentimes, early episode psychosis, one of the first things people are complaining about are ADHD and cognitive challenges, uh, which you know people don't necessarily think to ask follow-up questions about uh, when people come in talking about ADHD. Uh, and so, as noted earlier, there are some national guidelines which are being developed. Uh, if you're familiar with VA, sometimes it can take a very long time for these to be published, so it could be some time before these are approved. Uh, and we are a bit behind uh, community care in this regard. So just looking at uh, pure numbers, these are some numbers that uh, we've pulled out of Vision 1, that's New England. and. Uh, this is really a breakdown of veterans under the age of 35, uh, 18 to 35, and just looking at raw numbers. So the columns on the left are just Massachusetts VAs, and then uh, the ones on the right are all of New England. And, and really the takeaway from this is that, one, there are veterans here, uh, but two, if you look at the percentages, um, and I should say the total number of vets is the total number of veterans with an SMI diagnosis in the vision. It's not uh, our gross number. This is a small percentage of, of total number of vets. Uh, but what, if you, what you should take away from this is that it, we really are struggling with the true early onset psychosis. They're, they're just, we're not seeing a lot of people uh, very, very young in the 18 to 29 range. So we have quite a bit of work to do to engage those folks and identify them quickly. So uh, right now, uh, we're sort of at an interesting time. There's a lot of interest in starting these programs. Uh, STEER is the program that we have at Bedford. It stands for the Specialized Team for Early Engagement and Recovery. Uh, I'm not sure if I can call it the first VA. It, it was the first VA first episode, uh, first episode psychosis program, although there are other VAs that are in various stages of development of these models. Uh, we're utilizing the Navigate treatment model, so um, we the team can provide individual therapy, supplement it a little bit with some more CBT for psychosis. We can help people with shared decision making. We can do family interventions. And we partner with existing providers at Bedford who can handle the medication and also voc rehab services. It's been up and running since about 2015. Uh, initially, we were trying to uh, really drill down the Navigate uh, model and create a team uh, of identified staff members who really could fulfill each branch, uh, including the psychiatry and voc services that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but it's been a bit of a challenge, uh, particularly getting um, dedicated time for the medication providers for obvious reasons. It's not a huge program, uh, and so uh, it's it's been a bit of a challenge to try to get people to get protected time for seeing these vets. Right now, we're more focused on trying to um, coordinate 
uh, with other people who can provide these uh, services, like I mentioned, the voc rehab and the medication management. But um, we're also really looking at trying to see like if we can utilize some resources from across the vision to start providing some of these needed uh, arms in, in a bit of, as we mentioned earlier, the hub and spoke model. We really emphasize veterans in the first five years of uh, onset, although as mentioned earlier, it's often quite difficult to figure out exactly when onset was, so we are, are doing our best to guess at that. Um, but we can certainly provide services via CBT for psychosis for veterans outside of that range. Uh, as mentioned earlier, we're looking to try to develop uh, partnerships with other VAs in the VISN. Uh, we're also really working to try to be, uh, create better collaborations and connections with the Department of Defense to try to facilitate that uh, transition of care. Uh, we'd really, we haven't done this yet, but we'd really love to be able to utilize some of our telehealth capacity in order to start developing relationship with service members before they uh, discharge from service. Uh, and we're also really looking at trying to develop uh, better relationships with non-VA care providers in order to facilitate um, better referrals and also offer a wider range of resources to our vets. So that is uh, it for our presentation. We are happy to take questions at this point if anyone has any. And Tiffany is letting people know to use the chat box if you have any questions. This is, uh, I see a question coming in. This is Tiffany. Um, so I was interested in a little bit of more examples of family engagement efforts. Um, if you have any other, like, specific examples. Um, you had mentioned that some veterans, they want to involve their family, um, but maybe there, there's some strained relationships or um, stigma or they don't want right. to burden their families. Well, uh, I can speak a little bit about the vets in our program. I mean, Shirley is certainly a national expert in family engagement in VA, so Shirley, I don't know if you have uh, thoughts on that. I was, can you guys hear me? Yeah? Um, yes. Yeah, so I think there's a couple issues. If you go to navigateconsultants.org, um, you can get all our manuals, and you can see that what we propose is engagement and education. But the other thing, but but it's it's an ongoing problem. Even in Navigate, we only got 50% of the families involved, and you know it tends to be a little less with that. The other resource I would recommend to you is we now have a TMS course on veteran-centered brief family consultation the 4, uh, four CU course, and it basically goes into more in depth about doing shared decision making with the veteran to try to encourage them to involve their family, and then using the veteran as kind of leverage to invite the family in. And I think that's sort of the thing we haven't done as much, really sort of using the veteran and helping the veterans see the benefits so that, that they will agree to family involvement. It's an ongoing struggle, but I think, again, it's called the veteran Center Brief Family Consultation, and it's a good model, and it's, it's not so scary, you know, because it's only two or three sessions. We'd like people to stick around longer, and sometimes they do. But, um, you know, I think it's about activating the veteran and then making it easy for the families to get in. And, and there's a nice thing, if you go to the Navigate, consultants manual, the family stuff. There's a really nice handout in their family's love about quick tips to how to interact with your loved one when they're having a psychotic episode. And people love that, and that helps them stay in a little bit. So that's what I'd say. <laughs> Thank you. And I see that the Navigate website has been added to the web links um, in that web links pod, if, if anyone's interested in checking that out, too. And then there's a question from Marcy. Any word on future cognitive behavioral um, therapy, I guess for psychosis, um, EVP training through the VA? Okay, we beg. Uh, <laughs> um, 
you know, the, the challenge is right now that I don't think the regular EVP training program is going to take on any new interventions right this minute. So we have been trying to think about some workarounds with regard to that. Um, those probably some of you know, like at the LRC convention last year, Willie Landa was there doing training on CBTs for psychosis. We know it's important. I think we just need to keep getting a critical mass of people really pushing it and pushing the people who care about SMI, who in person there would be Jeff Burke, I think. Because um, I don't think it's going to come, and Chris Crow maybe, I don't think it's going to be able to come from the traditional EBP training program. I think it's going to have to come a different way. But we'd like it. <laughs> Thank you. I think we're at the end of our time, or a little bit over our time. Um, but I just want to be sure to thank everybody for attending today. I thank you especially to our speakers for this really informative presentation. For those of you who are interested in receiving a continuing education credit for participating in this webinar today, you can request this by completing the online evaluation. And I just typed the, the link to that online evaluation in the chat box. It's also in the notes uh, pod as well. Um, and as a reminder, CE is free for Division 18 members as a membership perk. For non-members who are interested in CE, you can um, pay a $15 fee uh, through our PayPal link, which is also found in the notes pod. And then CE certificates will be emailed to you guys in about two to three weeks. And I'll also follow up with an email explaining all of these instructions too. And then before we go, I want to remind everyone that um, of our next webinar coming up in one week on May 9th, Dr. Rodney Baker returns with part two of the history of VA psychology and psychology training covering years 1966 through 2016. And if you missed part one, you can check out the recording of it on the VA section webpage. And a flyer with more details about next week's webinar is available for download in the files pod. So thanks again, everybody, and goodbye. <laughs>